I would like to introduce you to your very first speaker for today. He is the Vice President of Food Safety for Ecolab, Mr. Tom Ford. Mr. Ford, you have the floor. Thank you, and welcome to everybody for joining us today on our Food Safety Matters WebEx. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing a colleague of mine, Dr. Anna Starobin. Anna Starobin is a senior food, uh, scientist and leader of the microbiology and food safety for Ecolab's global quick service restaurant and food retail services divisions. Her responsibilities cover food safety, environmental testing, equipment evaluation, outbreak prevention and recovery, regulatory product development and research done for Ecolab quick service restaurant and food retail customers in the United States and internationally. With more than 20 years of experience managing a microbiology laboratory, her team of microbiologists support customer-requested food safety projects, such as developing food safety procedures, testing products designed to reduce outbreak occurrences, and providing tools for outbreak recovery. Dr. Starobin is actively involved in industry food safety products. She's an author of several publications, patents, and multiple white papers. She gives food safety-related talks covering topics such as cleaning and sanitation, equipment design, hand care, environmental testing, and outbreak prevention recovery in the United States and internationally. She is a member of several industry organizations, including IAFP, IFT, CFP, and ASTM. And Dr. Starobin is a medical doctor from IM Sekhanov First Moscow State Medical University in a specialty of disease prevention and epidemiology, and she is also a certified food safety professional. So, Dr. Ahn, I'm going to turn over this session to you, and you can answer the question of whether to clean or not to clean. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, thank you for all of you who joined the session. I'll try to share with you uh, what I learned uh, working with biofilms, and uh, hopefully it will help all of us to do the right things in the future. So, uh, the question the name of my presentation, To Clean or Not to Clean, and you might find it interesting uh, coming from a microbiologist because most of my past responsibilities were related to killing microorganisms. Uh, cleaning was not part of what I was doing. Uh, I'm doing it now, so I'll share with you why it is the case. So. Uh, Today we're going to discuss a couple of things. We're going to talk a little bit about foodborne illness and contributing factors. What does it mean was rinse, sanitize, and why we do that? And then we're going to talk about biofilms, the main topic of our uh, my presentation today. So we'll talk about what the biofilms are, how else do we call them, where do we find them, how do they form, how do they become resistant or tolerant to antimicrobials, or do they? And how to treat them, how to take care of them. Now, um, the uh, reported uh, foodborne illness contributing factors between 98 and 2002, you can see this table, and I highlighted in blue the area which is related to inadequate cleaning of equipment. You can see that 22% of the outbreaks are related to these simple things like cleaning of equipment. And it's not just uh, a simple thing which we can overcome um, by using antimicrobial after that, and uh, that will take care of it. It's, it's a problem, and you'll see uh, throughout my presentation why it is a problem. Now, uh, a little refresher. We all know that uh, food code uh, requires us to go through three steps, wash, rinse, and sanitize. And uh, each of these steps is very important, and uh, they are not there just to fill up the page. So the washing step is designed to remove soils and organic matters because sanitizers are not going to be effective if we're going to apply them on the dirty surface, especially, especially uh, chlorine-based sanitizers. They are being uh, pretty much destroyed by residual organic matter. The re rinsing step uh, is designed to 
uh, remove the excess detergent which you uh, left behind after the, your washing step. Some of the detergents uh, will neutralize your uh, antimicrobial which you're going to use in your sanitizing step. So it is very important to make sure that we rinsed all the detergents and uh, the soil which we have removed uh, after our cleaning step. And after we effectively done all of that, we can uh, use our sanitizing step which is supposed to kill bacteria, uh, reduce bacteria by 99.999%. Uh, and it is important to understand that we are reducing bacteria, not necessarily killing everything, because killing everything is going to be more like disinfection or sterilization. Therefore, if we come to this step three sanitizing step with the least bacteria as possible, which we can achieve by mechanically removing them uh, by washing step, uh, we will be more successful in our sanitizing step. Now, uh, what happens when we do not clean and don't do the right thing? We are seeing biofilms, and we talk about biofilms a lot, but in my conversations with many people, it's just a word which really doesn't have uh, any background to it. So my goal today is share with you some of the information about biofilms. Uh, where do we find them? Uh, what are they? Uh, how do they form? How to treat them? So uh, in an this slide uh, gives you the different names under which we are uh, hiding the word biofilm. You hear a lot word slime, scum, sludge, sugar snake, walls. Uh, many of these words are really are representing the biofilm. We just call this biofilm differently. Uh, in the next several slides, I'll show you some uh, quite unpleasant pictures, which will show you the biofilms uh, in a different areas. Um, some of this you can see under each picture where the pictures that have been taken to from uh, by, and um, you can see who is the author of those uh, uh, images. So this is a slide of the uh, toilet. We've seen this. Uh, Stains before, um, not many of us thought of biofilm at that time, but it is a biofilm. Uh, now, this is another, it's a drain, industrial drain. You can see pretty well built biofilm. Uh, Center for Biofilm Engineering in Montana provided us with this slide, as many others in this presentation. Uh, the next slide uh, shows us well-known areas of problems in ice machines. And everybody who has ice machine or looked inside of the ice machine have seen images like that. Uh, there are more of them. Uh, unfortunately, because the ice machines are closed and not necessarily uh, on the view of us or health inspectors, um, we see that more often than we would love to see them. So we see a lot of biofilms within ice machines. This is another set of images uh, which we've taken uh, in the beverage towers. Uh, in many restaurants, you would be able to find something like that. Uh, people usually call them sugar snakes. Uh, this is a layer of cellulose which were built uh, by bacteria, produced by bacteria called the Cetobacter. And uh, a lot of uh, uh, restaurants and grocery chains are very familiar with these images. We, were, uh, we took it uh, in uh, a restaurant or several restaurants, actually. Uh, now, um, this is another um, video. Uh, which uh, was taken in one of the restaurants, which shows you um, an image which many of you might have seen. Just look at it for a minute. Okay. 
you see this material on the side of the dispensing equipment, and when this gentleman pulls it, it's kind of, again, could be called slime, or you call it differently. It is truly biofilm. It is a truly biofilm, what we're seeing here. And I'm sure that is not uh, unfamiliar to many of you. You've seen that. Now, um, so the next question is, how do biofilms form? Um, you may know that bacteria could uh, live in a uh, planktonic, uh, uh, free conditions, free flowing conditions, or could be attached to the surface. So when the bacteria uh, is free flowing bacteria, it has the image of the bacteria in the middle. So it has a cell membrane, cell wall. Uh, intracellular material, flagellum. Uh, when the bacteria start attaching to the surface, it starts producing extracellular polymetric material with which it attaches to the surface. Um, while bacteria are so-called hairy cells with this extracellular polymers, which would allow them to stick to the surface. Uh, this is, again, a picture from uh, Biofield Engineering Center from Montana State, uh, showing the process of bacteria uh, attachment and forming biofilm. Biofilms form when bacteria adhere to the surface in aqueous environments and begin to ex excrete a slimy glue-like substance, then can anchor to any kind of metal materials, plastic, or soil practic uh, particles. So on the first part, attachment part, you can see free-flowing microorganisms. Uh, when they bounce to the surface and nobody cleans the surface for some period of time, they get comfortable and start producing this uh, glue-like substance, which eventually will cover them and become a biofilm. At that point, uh, the process is still reversible. So if we clean at that point, we can uh, easily remove this initial biofilm formation. If we neglect the cleaning process, the biofilm and bacteria within the biofilm will start grow. You can see on a stage two, this growing biofilm, so this bacteria within this uh, structure, within this glue-like substance, is growing. And at the stage three, we could see that not only it grown, it could be broken, and the bacteria can get free and cause a lot of problems in our environment. Uh, but even if, if we can take part of the biofilm out, the rest of it is still there. And it's already uh, not a reversible process, and it's very difficult to remove this biofilm if we allowed it to grow to a stage uh, shown on these pictures. Now, uh, biofilm uh, is very uh, complicated structure. It could be formed by a single bacteria, but most often, the not, it's, it's a community of mi multiple microorganisms, um, bacteria, fungi, algae, protozoa. It could be debris and corrosion products. So anything and everything could be part of this biofilm. Now, on the next slide, uh, there is a picture, uh, again, uh, Montana State University, showing the layers of the microorganisms within this biofilm. On the top, you can see bacteria which require the oxygen presence, uh, the purple ones, and require some uh, food, some nutrition, uh, which are easily delivered. Uh, on the bottom, there are anaerobic bacteria, the ones which can live without the presence of oxygen, and they 
pretty well live there. Uh, some bacteria can use a uh, byproduct of another microbial species as a nutrient for their own activities. So this structure is quite complicated and has a lot of um, abilities to survive within this biofilm. Uh, this is a 3D uh, image of the biofilm taken in one of our labs uh, in Ecolab, showing you the uh, dynamic of formation of the biofilm. So you see it's not a flat structure, it's a uh, very complicated, very interesting looking uh, creature, I can call it. Um, in addition to that, uh, these microorganisms within the biofilm uh, they are living organisms and uh, they live in a communities and they can talk to each other through chemical signals. Uh, this communication informs bacteria when there are sufficient number of their community to safety mount and attack their community produced toxins. So they can let each other know what's happening. So they are smart and we need to outsmart them, right? Um, now, when we allowed this biofilm to form and hide the bacteria within this biofilm, uh, we start using our sanitizers, hoping that we're going to kill whatever we didn't clean. Uh, I have a picture of a person uh, with umbrella to give you some ideas how this bacteria feel like they are pretty much covered with this umbrella of this biofilm glue-like material. So we can pour our sanitizer on top of it, uh, but bacteria within the biofilm would not be affected at all. Uh, so antimicrobial would not be able to penetrate the biofilm. Uh, this is another picture showing the biofilm dy um, dynamics. Uh, you can see uh, on the top of the biofilm the yellow portion of it. It's uh, antimicrobial had been slowly penetrating through the top of the biofilm and most likely took care of the microorganism on the very top level of the biofilm. The deeper we go, the less chances of the antimicrobials uh, antimicrobials have to kill those bacteria. And you can see the purple bacteria in the bottom, those are which did not have enough of the um, concentration of the your antimicrobial and they become uh, persistent in the environment. So when the uh, biofilm is broken, mechanically or otherwise, they get released and then even in a free stage, we cannot kill them because they learn how to uh, survive uh, our antimicrobials, how to tolerate them. Um, in addition to that, the uh, microorganisms in pink, they are those which learn how to live on a low metabolism and uh, compared to planktonic organisms, which are free-floating organisms, they are uh, much more difficult to kill. Uh, it's worth to notice that uh, when we test our antimicrobials for EPA registration, we test free-floating organisms. So the data and efficacy information is available to all of us based on this free-floating organism. So we need to be mindful that our sanitizers are designed to kill bacteria which are not within the biofilm. Now, the next slide is, has been uh, created in uh, one of the labs e within Ecolab, and you can see the red part of it is where the antimicrobial was able to get through. Uh, the green part is where antimicrobial didn't get through, and even 
although we might have killed the top layers of bacteria in this biofilm, the ones in green are pretty well alive and flourishing, and uh, they'll continue to grow. Uh, the next slide also been taken in one of our labs in Ecolab, and uh, this uh, our energy service uh, was doing this work. And uh, you can see in green the top uh, figure is untreated biofilm, and then there are two chemicals tested. Uh, one is partially uh, treating the biofilm, and another pretty much took care of it. So there's a way to uh, evaluate different antimicrobials. Uh, so there's a lot of research similar to that going on, but it's kind of interesting. Now, what are the signs of the biofilm presence? First of all, uh, we see and many of you have seen that uh, visual uh, rainbow appearance of the surfaces. That is one of the indications of the biofilm presence. Sometimes you see a uh, feel, slimy feel of the equipment. This is a biofilm. Uh, sour or musty odor. Uh, we've talked to many of our customers who are dealing with biofilm in uh, beverage towers. Uh, beverage towers, as I showed you in some of our pictures, get clogged with these biofilms. And our customers are telling us that they start feeling this vinegar smell about the same time when they need to call a plumber. So this smell is something to pay attention to. If you have this vinegar type or sour smell, it most likely than not you might have a biofilm in your system. Well, uh, product sign, it's more manufacturing, loss of the shelf life, spoilage, uh, product micro failures. Um, if you were to do some testing, you would see the spike in microorganism counts. Uh, when you start cleaning you would, and sanitizing, you would expect the numbers to go down. Uh, that may not be the case when you are dealing with biofilms because you're just breaking it up, uh, the biofilms up, and your bacteria are coming out. Um, you will see increase in environmental positives. Again, you can break up the biofilms, and the bacteria which were hiding within the biofilm might show up. And increase your failure of your ATP readings also uh, could be the result of the presence of the biofilm. If you see that, then you need to do more cleaning. Uh, this is the work we have done in uh, one of our customers' restaurants. Uh, and it's very common. The pictures on the right is the fountain system. And they are com covered with this biofilm slimy material. It's very difficult to clean them because you have to be upside down pretty much to see them. And design is very complicated, as you can see. It's, it's really hard uh, to clean them. So when we uh, did clean them, we found out that uh, after the first cleaning, you can see the the before cleaning. So everything up to above the red line is. Uh, higher than we want it to be, so it's a failing result. Then after the first cleaning, we seen pretty good reduction, we thought, and then we continued to clean and the numbers went up because we started to breaking, breaking up the biofilms. And then gradually we started to see the improvement, but it took us several attempts to uh, get to the results we wanted to see. So let's talk about biofilm removal and control. So as you have guessed from everything I talked about so far, uh, preventing biofilm formation is a more desirable option than uh, treatment of the biofilms. It's much easier to treat them than uh, to prevent them to, from formation than to treat them. Uh, the main strategy to prevent biofilm formation is to clean and disinfect on a regular basis before bacteria has a chance to attach uh, to the surfaces. 
uh, you need to be mindful of your equipment design. If your equipment is not cleanable and allows you accumulation of the soil, this is the recipe for biofilm formation. Uh, you need to look for dead ends and for the gaskets and uh, many other things which we have covered uh, during our other presentations uh, talking about hygiene and design of equipment. Um, now, when cleaning is happening, there are multiple ways of do the cleaning, and I'll cover a couple of them. Uh, chemical methods are obvious ones. Um, before application of the sanitizer, it is essential to eliminate as much soil as possible. We talked about that. Most cleaning agents used in the food industry are alkaline, uh, and therefore removal of um, fat and protein is well, going to be achieved by this uh, chemistry. Acid cleaners used to remove precipitates of minerals. Uh, there are some studies done, and uh, the reference within the text, uh, cleaning with alkali, uh, especially with chelators such as EDTA, is more effective at removal biofilms. So there is a lot of work being done uh, to evaluate different chemistries. Uh, biological methods, uh, one of the biological methods which is commonly used is enzymes. Uh, combination of enzymes required since uh, the uh, polymeric material are mixed, they're different ones. So you have to really evaluate what, you, uh, what your product does or doesn't. Um, These uh, enzymatic products could be enhanced by addition of detergents and surfactants. There are products like that in the market. Uh, there are some products uh, lately developed with antimicrobials built in them. So there is a lot of different uh, options, and you might want to talk to your uh, chemical supplier to um, identify the best product available for you. Uh, some attempts were made, some research was done to figure out what the water will do. Apparently, the water at 100 degrees Fahrenheit and higher will rapidly kill your microorganism within biofilms. Uh, but it will not physically remove the soil. Proteins in the biofilm may coagulate, making them even more difficult to remove. And residual deposits uh, will become a nutrient for your future biofilm growth. Therefore, just using hot water may not be a good solution because you may not see the bacteria right away, but you will uh, create all the conditions for the future bacteria growth in biofilm growth, matter of fact. Now, the major sanitizers which we are using in food retail are uh, hypochlorides, uh, peroxygen compounds, quads, uh, parasitic acid, uh, found to be quite effective against uh, biofilm within bacteria. Again, uh, talk to your uh, suppliers, chemical suppliers. They'll help you to choose the right one. Uh, These several slides were uh, kindly provided by uh, Dr. Badnar from uh, Tyson Food. Uh, he presented them uh, during the recent IAFP uh, meeting. Um, now, a couple of words about regulatory status. Um, many of you might have noticed that you don't see too many products on the market with the biofilm claims. And um, there is a reason to it. Uh, EPA does not have at that point a standard test method um, to um, allow us to make biofilm claims and to evaluate uh, antimicrobials to show that they are effective. They also don't have uh, published uh, log reductions which you, we need to achieve uh, for, uh, to, to, to pass this test. Uh, even though we are hearing that they're very close to making this decision and we will see uh, more and more products with the biofilm claims as they finalize their work. Um, 
historically, they did not allow us to use the uh, term slime and biofilm interchangeably. So people took, took uh, steps by calling, like, kills bacteria within slime. Well, EPA told us you have to be careful about this because slime is considered to be a biofilm. Uh, EPA does not allow us to use the term biofilm or slime to publish health-related products. So if I am telling people that I am uh, going to kill this tree within the biofilm, uh, it becomes a public health claim, and we need to wait until EPA uh, comes up with a procedure and standards uh, to make such a claim. Uh, labeling is also a difficult thing for the biofilm-related claims, and EPA has a whole uh, list of rules how to label the products, and there is a list, uh, link to uh, explanations how to label things if anybody is interested. Um, in summary, because biofilms form rapidly, and once established are difficult to remove, prevention of the biofilm formation would be the best strategy for all of us. Regular cleaning and sanitizing minimizes bacterial attachment. Regularly clean and sanitize areas where biofilm are, are likely to form, so if we are seeing the dead ends or areas like these nozzles which I showed you, uh, the pictures of, uh, this are the areas which we need to uh, particularly pay attention. Chemical sanitizers alone may not eliminate biofilm because they are not able to penetrate through biofilm and may be inactivated by the large amount of organic and inorganic matter present. Um, I wanted to note here uh, something about uh, very common questions which we are getting about resistance and the need to rotate sanitizers. Before you start rotating sanitizers, you need to make sure that you took care of your biofilms. It doesn't matter which sanitizer you're pouring over your biofilm. It's not going to get through. The best procedure for removing biofilm is to use an alkaline cleaner with plenty of brushing, scrubbing, scraping to break up the structure, making sure, though, that you are not spreading your pathogens all over by this scraping. So you need to be mindful of the fact that the bacteria which you are scraping would be spread around if you are not careful. And then sanitizers, after you got rid of your biofilms, sanitizers can be then applied to kill the remaining microorganisms. So at that, um, I would be glad to take your questions if you have any, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Anna. Uh, that was really insightful. I particularly like the uh, graphical representations of the uh, biofilm and the effect of the antimicrobials. That was really cool and interesting that you were able to get that. Um, I want to remind everybody, uh, as we said in the outset of the uh, session, to use the Q&A uh, text box in the bottom right hand of your screen to tap in any questions that you have for Dr. Sorobin that we can answer right now. So be glad to lead us and moderate it through this uh, question and answer session. So Anna, I'm gonna throw the first question out to you. Um, a lot of the people dealing with uh, biofilms have established biofilms already. Can you lead us through any discussions around a remediation process in situations where they already do have a biofilm form? What would you recommend as a process? Well, um, we have experience uh, working with such biofilms. Unfortunately, uh, most of the chemicals which we use in food retail uh, are not very harsh. They are good chemicals when you use them on a daily basis, and you can use them without safety glasses or wearing goggles or wearing gloves. And it's safe for the employees which are handling those products. When you have biofilm, you might need to use harsher 
products much more um, corrosive and not as may not be as friendly to the environment as the products which we are using on a regular basis. So again, I'm uh, repeating that you do not you try not to get to this point, but when you do, you might need to use these harsh chemicals to uh, get rid of your um, biofilm. In many cases, it requires repeated treatment. It may not be done in one uh, attempt. And then after that, you, m you m will need to use your uh, sanitizers at uh, concentrations which you have them registered. Uh, but again, the best thing to do is not to let that happen. Okay, thank you for that. Um, can bacteria be reintroduced by dirty brushes or utensils? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, they known to be one of the main sources for uh, cross-contamination, especially uh, we see it with listeria situation in a deli department. If you read uh, literature, uh, you will see that uh, squidges are known to be uh, very well contaminated with uh, listeria, and therefore uh, they are um, potentially could be a source uh, for cross-contamination. So imagine you just cleaned your floor and then you rinsed it and you sanitized it and then uh, allowed it to air dry uh, and then you pushed it with a squeegee to a drain. And squeegee which was not cleaned and sanitized properly uh, may reintroduce your listeria into the environment. Uh, another challenge with the cleaning tools, when you choose the cleaning tools, you need to make sure that they are cleanable. Uh, and uh, as you may know, the porous surfaces could not be sanitized very well. Uh, so you need to be very mindful of the choosing your uh, cleaning tools uh, in order to prevent this secondary cross-contamination from your cleaning tools. Very good. Thank you for that. Another question, uh, and I'll just read it as is because I like the way it's phrased. Other than it being totally disgusting, are there any foodborne illnesses connected with biofilms? Uh, listeria definitely is known to be a source of uh, comes from biofilms because we see a lot of listeria outbreaks and uh, the fact that we're seeing persistent microorganisms within uh, our grocery chains and restaurants uh, tells us that they were hiding somewhere and were not getting enough of a sanitizer concentration uh, and most likely they were hiding within the biofilm. So, uh, I do not know if there is epidemiological evidence showing that this biofilm was the source of this persistent strain, but uh, one can guess that they uh, were hiding in the biofilms and within biofilms and learning how to uh, not to react to our antimicrobials. Excellent. And I know you've done some work personally on biofilms, and here's a question getting down to some specifics. Are biofilms more likely to attach to plastic versus stainless steel, or is it completely based on the ability to clean? I don't necessarily think that it's a plastic or a metal or anything. It's how rough is the surface and how long ago have you cleaned it and what other uh, particles are on the surface. So it's, it's not straightforward. Uh, the surface which is smoother probably will have less attachment, but uh, on the other hand, considering the size of the microorganism, um, they will well attach to the surfaces. And it doesn't take too long for them to attach. So uh, cleaning and sanitizing surfaces every four hours per food code um, make a lot of sense. 
Very good. I did want to mention to everybody we do have some time here, so please use the question and answer uh, section. I'm going through these right now, so there's a good chance we'll get to your particular question. Um, are biofilms only in moist areas, or can they be also on relatively dry pieces of kitchen equipment or surfaces? They could be on a dry piece of uh, equipment, but most likely than not, at some point, this surface was wet at some point, and then it dried, and the biofilm dried on it, and probably uh, would be able to form there probably not as fast, but um, usually they form very well in a moisture-type condition. Um, and it's very difficult to remove them. I worked in uh, one of the restaurants um, uh, helping our customers internationally. Uh, was in a different country and saw uh, pretty well uh, formed biofilm on a surface which looked very dry. Uh, it was a connection between two uh, prep tables which was not sealed. And in this not sealed area, it was pretty well designed biofilm, formed biofilm. And it looked very dry, but it definitely was wet at some point. Thank you. Um, here's a question. Does it help to increase the concentration of sanitizer? Uh, there are a couple of things to it. First of all, you can use the concentration which is allowed by EPA. So a lot of sanitizers our days are registered at a range, 150 to 400 ppm. So you cannot legally use sanitizers higher than the concentration uh, they're registered at. Now, if you are following these rules, uh, increasing your concentration from 100 feet, from 200, usually commonly used for quads, right, to 400 may help some, but not a lot, because you still need to get through your biofilm. And your sanitizer is not a detergent. It's not going to break this biofilm structure. So you can pour as much as you want, and if you did not uh, break the biofilm and do not have an access to your microorganisms, it doesn't matter what you're pouring over your biofilm. It might help some, but not much. Great, thank you. Um, how do you ensure that you have removed the soil or biofilm before you apply the sanitization step? Well, um, there is a uh, known validation and verification step, so you, you have to do your homework. You have to start evaluating the surfaces and cleaning processes uh, as prior to developing your processes or as a pro procedure development. You need to learn what needs to be done to clean well and develop the procedure which will take care of the biofilm formation. And when you've done that and wrote relevant procedure, you will go through the process to verify that it works. So after the procedure has been implemented, you have to go randomly and do your swabbing, maybe do your ATP work. There's a lot of interesting uh, things you can do, uh, but you have to um, decide uh, ahead of time how are you going to validate your process, what are you going to do, what, what you are going to consider to be clean duty, whatever. So it's a lot of homework to be done uh, in order to prevent the biofilm formation and make sure that you are doing the things right. Very good. Uh, this particular question deals specifically with the drain system. So once steps are taken to clean a drain system, would quad-based sanitizers used several times a day be adequate in the, to prevent the reaccumulation of biofilm? 
again, quad sanitizers are not necessarily good deter even even they are even they, if they are formulated with the detergents, they are not good cleaners. So the prevention of biofuel formation is a cleaning activity, not sanitizing activity. After you've done your cleaning and removed your biofilm, if you're going to con continue just pouring sanitizer to your drain, eventually you'll see the biofilm formed again, maybe slower, but it's going to form again because you do need to take care of your um, soils and uh, you need to remove bacteria which eventually will become the beginner of your biofilm formation. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a couple good questions here as I'm scrolling through here to uh, stay with us. Do restaurants, in your experience, Anna, and you just mentioned that you work with a lot of restaurants around the world, do restaurants train their employees to clean and recognize biofilms? Not to my experience. They pretty well know, many of them know this beverage tower, Sugar Snake. They're very familiar with that. They've seen it a lot. Um, but I haven't seen much of other uh, activities around biofilms. And in, and in retail, we see it a lot uh, uh, in connection with slicers lately. But mm, and people who deal with slicers are aware of the biofilm potential in listeria in connection with this. Uh, so the restaurants which are dealing with slicers or complicated equipment, they may know about this. But uh, in general, um, uh, quick service restaurants don't work with them. There's a couple questions here, and I'll add them together here. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation about some chemicals and chemistries being harsher or more aggressive than others. Can you give some more uh, information around that? There seems to be some questions around what is a, specifically a harsh chemical. Well, this is a good question for your chemical supplier. They will help you. But in general, um, as I mentioned, most of the chemistries which are developed for daily use for the restaurants are designed to be uh, environmentally friendly. They're designed to be employee friendly. Uh, you do not want chemical which is used on a daily basis to be harsh and harm people's hands so they wouldn't be able to work or require wearing a lot of personal protective equipment. Therefore, most of the chemicals designed for this daily use are designed with all this, all the above in mind. They are very good cleaners for a daily work. But when you have something not clean for a long time and you have a biofilm, then you'll have to move to a different category of the cleaning chemicals which do not meet the requirements I just mentioned. Uh, again, you need to work with your chemical uh, supplier to identify the chemistries which are harsher or more difficult to use. Uh, we have some of the chemicals, they, we, we honestly we don't like our customers to use them. Uh, we help them. If, if they in a need, we might help them to, to do this ourselves because they are, uh, our restaurant employees are not trained to work with the chemicals like that. Here's a two-part question, and uh, I'll, I'll let you use your experience around this one. So does pressure washing remove biofilm? And that's one part of the question. The second half is, would the pressure typically seen in a dishwasher remove biofilm? Uh, I do not know the answer for the second question because I don't have experience working with uh, dishwashers uh, much. But I expect, suspect that the answer would be uh, Yes, if it has a chemistry, if it's a hot water, I talked about hot water, what hot water will do, right? Uh, 
pressure washer will probably mechanically uh, remove biofilms, but uh, it will spread your bacteria, which is within the biofilm, all over around. So you're going to be aerosolizing your uh, bacteria, and that's not a good practice. It's something we're uh, trying to avoid uh, by any means to to not to spread the microorganisms which were just sitting within this biofilm, and now we have them all over the restaurant or grocery store. Excellent. Uh, we still have some time for some questions, so please use the Q&A box. I uh, have a question a little bit more technical. It deals with the uh, EPA concern that you, uh, you mentioned around there uh, addressing e uh, the biofilm terminology, and it gets into the actual testing components. So how is testing for antimicrobial efficacy against biofilms conducted? So, yeah, that's really technical. Um, so um, there are multiple versions of a biofilm reactors. They're called biofilm reactors, a very military sound. Um, they have a different design, and you can grow biofilms uh, which are tougher or not as tough. Um, there is a reactor which was designed by CDC. Uh, it's called CDC reactor, and it seems like uh, EPA uh, is liking it more than others. So from what we uh, heard and know, the uh, Montana State University developed the test method, and it is now uh, American Standard Test Method uh, approved uh, by ASTM as official test method. And EPA is, seems like uh, liking it, and uh, from uh, the recent presentation which was uh, made by Dr. Tamasina during the IFP uh, meeting uh, late July, um, it sounds like this is the method which we are going to be using to, do, uh, to, to do, have a registration. He mentioned that um, the products which um, would be uh, allowed to have a biofilm claim, uh, probably would be disinfectants, and uh, we would have to pass the test uh, and achieve six log reductions versus five for a regular sanitizer, and the test organism would be different from those we're using for sanitizers. So it would be much tougher uh, to kill this bacteria um, in this test. Um, but biofilms are grown on the coupons, which are inserted in those reactors, and then we treat these coupons with different chemistries and see how much do we have left. So um, it's very interesting test method, uh, nothing like what we used to deal with, and um, we hope to see them uh, published soon and uh, start working on them. All right, I think we have uh, time for maybe one more question here. Uh, and the questions, there's a couple of them dealing with how do you actually uh, deal with tricky surfaces like cracks and crevices, hard to reach places to remove a biofilm? It's probably easier to do on a flat surface, but what about some areas? Are there strategies that you should recommend on cracks, crevices, or tight places? Well, first of all, we need to make sure that we have as little as possible of these cracks and surfaces because the surface per foot code is supposed to be easily cleaned, right? So if we have areas which are difficult to clean, they are not in compliance with the foot code requirements. Uh, second of all, if you happen to have areas like that, you have to be mindful of those areas and be particularly attentive to cleaning those areas on a regular basis. Um, you might have develop a schedule where you have a deep clean once a week, once a month, where you are specifically taking care of these areas. But again, the best solution of it to reconstruct these areas and uh, get rid of them. The example I was bringing to you, um, the um, Space between two cutting, uh, two prep tables. Uh, while I was there, they sealed it, so we took care of that this way. So I asked them to seal it, and they did. 
So this is the best, best thing you can do. Well, Anna, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. It was just a marvelous presentation. And for those of you uh, that are interested in getting access to this at a later date or sharing it with your colleagues, a recording of this presentation will be available Friday, August 21st at the link that you see on your screens right now. And we typically do share all the presentations for later viewing. And this one's a particular interesting one. So look for this by Friday. And I want to remind all of the listeners that the Food Safety Matters is an ongoing webinar service that we provide here at Ecolab. It's held the third Tuesday of every month. The next one will be September 15th. It's always at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And we're lucky enough to bring you Dr. John Barke, who's our senior scientist, pest elimination from Ecolab, who will be keeping it clean in 2015, what's bugging you this fall, dealing with small flies and cockroaches. So please join us on September 15th for our next Food Safety Matters webcast. And as you exit this, uh, please remember that there's a survey. So we only get better if you tell us what you want to talk about and what you want to hear on these sessions. So please take the time out to fill out that survey so we can meet your needs and keep this uh, as uh, elite of a process as we can. And you also can get your CEU uh, certificates at that time as well. So once again, this is Tom Ford, Vice President of Food Safety for Ecolab, thanking you for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you at our next Food Safety Matters webcast on September 15th. Thank you. Have a great afternoon.